Right, so today my search for transformational objects takes me to the Department of Zoology in Cambridge where I am meeting with Dr Emily Mitchell who is Curator of Invertebrates and Assistant Professor. Hello Emily. Hi, lovely to be here chatting to you. Well, thank you so much for having this conversation with me and I believe that you might have an object that you'd like to share with us and for the libraries. Could you tell me a little bit about what you've got for us? So what we've got is uh, a fossil from Charnwood Forest in the UK. And so this fossil uh, transformed our understanding of evolution of life on Earth and even how we understand evolution itself. So this fossil is Charnia masoni and it was found by school children in the 1950s. So it's particularly exciting because it was the first fossil found in rocks known to be Precambrian. And this was a huge deal. So before we knew there were fossils in the, what's known as a Cambrian time period, around 540 million years ago. And uh, these were very well known throughout the world. Things like trilobites and also um, trackways or traces of fossils appear in Cambrian rocks all over the world relatively quickly. You see them in the rocks um, all over the world. To a penny. Yeah, the very, the very common, the very abundant, very diverse. And this was something that Darwin was aware of. But Darwin did not like this at all. Because if his ideas of natural selection were correct, you shouldn't see life just appearing out of nowhere. You should see a slow, gradual build-up. And uh, you don't see that in the fossil, fossil record, or you didn't at Darwin's time. However, uh, with this fossil, that changed everything, because you, this is an illustration of an animal that predates the Cambrian and so is one of the first animals. So it shows the build up to the Cambrian explosion that's known and yeah, solved all of Darwin's problems. And it's, it's a grey slate object with quite a shallow imprint, isn't it? Ye yes. And um, let me try and see if I can describe it. Well, it, it looks to me well, it looks kind of fern-like, but that's an animal, or is it a it, kind of a plant? It is. Like? They do look a lot like plants, and when they were first found, they thought that maybe they were a sort of plant because they look so plant-like. So you've got the base where it's stuck to the sea floor, and then you've got the kind of frondy bits, the fern-like bits, that were upright in the water column feeding. Uh, but we know that they couldn't have been plants or algae because the rocks are found in can only be formed in deep water. And you actually, in some parts of the world, you see five or six kilometres of this deep water rocks with no, no sense of shallow water, which means we know that they couldn't have been photosynthetic because they're well beneath where light can get to. So this, this object, which was, as you say, found by school children, yeah. amazingly transformed our thinking or maybe reinforced Darwin's view of evolution or mm. as it were to some extent proved him right mm. and how did that then enable our understanding of how life evolved how did that progress and what's happened since then because that was in the 1950s 50s. did you say that's correct yes so when we first found these we, we had no idea what they were because the sort of body patterns you see the body plans you only find in this pre-cambrian ediacaran time period you don't find them elsewhere in the fossil record or alive today and so this makes it really hard to work out what they're up to so if you think of your kind of traditional paleontology you'd look at animals that are alive today and then see well actually this dinosaur has some bird-like features some reptile-like features for example and, and and see how they all fit together whereas if you have no points of comparison it's really really hard and as a result what this means is that when, when uh, Tina and Roger found this fossil, uh, people weren't sure at all what it was. So people thought it might have been a plant, but over the years people have suggested kind of fungi, protists, lichens, corals, sponges. In fact, for a long time, because their body plans are so different to everything else alive today, they were suggested to be an extinct kingdom. And the idea is life got large and complicated in the Ediacaran, but ultimately couldn't survive, died out, and then paved the way for animals to follow in the Cambrian. Wow, and so we are really looking right back at the beginnings of the formation of life forms on Earth. Well, we're looking at the first complex, large things in the history of life on Earth, but actually life has existed on Earth pretty much since it formed over four billion years ago. But for most of this time, life has been microbial. So we know it existed from uh, the microfossil record. And also when you get a lot of these microbes together, they can form physical large structures that you can see with your naked eye. And it's one of the really interesting questions for me is why did we have 
three billion years of life with just microbes, but then suddenly we get these animals, these complex organisms appearing as if out of nowhere. And how do you go about trying to answer some of those questions? I mean, because <laughs> what boggles my mind is we are talking such a long time ago and the evidence, well, to, to my naked eye, seems so fragile or, or so incomplete. It's amazing how you were able to play detective and put all the pieces together. Well, uh, it, it is a wonderful time period to be working because the preservation is really, really good. So if we think about fossils, we tend to think of uh, things with hard parts, so things like shells uh, or, or skeletons, so your dinosaur bones. Uh, but these first animals were soft. They're soft and squishy, <laughs> like uh, a, a sea pen, for example. And what that means is that they wouldn't normally be preserved, this sort of thing. It's very hard to preserve them. However, in the Ediacaran time period, when this Charnia first, first existed, um, it was a very, very different sort of environment. So this predated predators and the ability to move. And so what that meant is that there's a lot less chance for... Um, for all the fossils to be mixed up because they were soft-bodied and because there's nothing around to eat them. So if you have uh, a jellyfish floating around the oceans and it dies, you're unlikely to find that preserved because it will decay, the bacteria will decay it, um, but also it might get eaten by something else or something might kind of bur bury through it and churn up the sediment all around it. Whereas in the Ediacaran, especially at Charnwood Forest, what we see is a very exceptional pres preservation where you have volcanic ash flow underwater, which smothered everything where it was living. So it's rather like Pompeii and everything died very quickly. And because there's nothing around to eat it, <laughs> um, they stayed and you get these kind of casts and moulds. So while um, what you actually get in the Ediacaran is thousands of fossils preserved where they were living within their communities. And by comparing the spatial patterns, you can then infer what, what they were doing, so how they were interacting with each other and and how they're reproducing which of course feeds back into evolution because that's what's driving it you know kind of how your reproduction how you're choosing what to survive what's out competing what wow and so gradually you're piecing together at least something of the narrative of of how everything evolved <laughs> that that's that's the aim <laughs> we're that's definitely getting there the holy grail. <laughs> yes yeah trying to exactly trying to work out how you know what was driving the evolution of these early animals and just then putting that in context if we were to know more and, it, and as your research that you're doing develops how does that inform our thinking today do you think or what what can we carry forward from that most of the models we're using were developed for forest ecology. And so there hasn't been that much work done on animal communities, so things like corals and sponges. And so a lot of our work at the moment is actually trying to work out how the modern animals were reacting and kind of what sort of circumstances do their community dynamics change. And so the key areas we're looking at is in Antarctica uh, and also for soft coral reefs in, in places like Fiji. So that has a... a, a... A, I was going to say a real world <laughs> conservation mm. benefit for mm. today and, and we need it don't we in terms of trying to mm. keep our precious ecosystems healthy and active and, and respect and, and mm. know what they need. Uh, very much so. So while I don't personally do conservation work, one of the, uh, uh, well, I've got colleagues in British Antarctic Survey, um, and they they work a lot more on the conservation, on the interface between the science and conservation. But one of the papers we did together was looking at community dynamics of Antarctic benthic systems, so seafloor systems. And what we found, so this was the first time that people had analysed the entire community and as a kind of network of interactions rather than just individual interactions potentially between pairs of species. And what we showed is how crucial sponges are to the ecosystem. They provide habitat, but they do more than that. They, they attract other species towards them. So they're very, very crucial for the, uh, the, the ecosystem. And the potential conservation ramification of that is... So when we're thinking about conservation in Antarctica, we need to work out at what point, if we're fishing, for example, do we need to stop fishing? And one of the metrics that's used is if you get a coral or a sponge over a certain size, you need to stop fishing because there's big life that go, <laughs> you, sh you shouldn't be going there. It needs to stay protected. Whereas what, we're, what this analysis demonstrated is that actually sponges are more important than a similar sized coral. They have a more bigger impact on the rest of the community. So they potentially need protecting more than other similarly sized organisms. It's amazing how interconnected it all is and, and uh, this library of the great silences, this project thinking about how we can maybe think differently and, and our, our place in, in the grand scheme of things. Mm -hmm. 
and the idea that the great silence that we might be heading for an a, a, a existential disaster if we, uh, if we don't change our ways a little bit. And it's amazing how you're reaching back over vast periods of time, understanding what happened then, but allowing that to inform our thinking and hopefully to transform some of our practices in, in the real world today. Very, very much so. It's, yeah. uh, there's a lot of potential kind of uh, very interesting applications for using these sorts of analyses just to understand how ecosystems function and what are the key things that we need to be watching out for and protecting. I also wanted to ask you a little bit about uh, your role at the Museum of Zoology because that is a fantastic resource where people can come and look at some of the amazing collection that you've got. Can you tell me a little bit, bit about the museum and some of the things that people might be able to see there? So I am the curator of non-insect invertebrates within the Museum of Zoology. And so things like corals fall under my uh, collections. Within the museum, we've got a huge range of different things. So what you see on the, in the displays, for example, in the museums, you've got wonderful corals, you've got wonderful uh, skeletons, for example, uh, is a small part of actually the total collection. So if you go behind the scenes, we have a wonderful, wonderful array of different different creatures. So we've got lovely, lovely corals, lovely crabs and crustaceans, lovely mollusks, so different kind of bivalves and clams and a huge variety of different uh, specimens which record and and because a because it's a historical museum we've we've got collections that date back hundreds of years which means you you've got kind of how the world's changed reflected in all our wonderful different organisms so you you can see how different organisms adapt to different sorts of environmental changes and what's what's going on uh, within them and their their worlds and how that kind of links back to us and our human changes now, I must also ask you about this most amazing thing that I came across in your bio when I was looking uh, at all the work that you've been doing, because you're also, I believe, uh, involved with the Leverhulme Centre for Life in the Universe. So um, I'm a yeah, co-director at the uh, Leverhulme Centre for Life in the Universe, which we uh, set up last year in, in Cambridge. And the idea of this, this centre is to bring together all the dis different disciplines that are working to understand the possibility of life elsewhere. So we've had this amazing revolution uh, in various different sciences. So starting with Didier Kalos, who found the first ever exoplanet, so that's planet outside our ecosystem. So he, uh, he heads up the centre. And so since he first discovered this, this exoplanet in uh, 1995, we've found, well, we, <laughs> as humanity, uh, we've found thousands of other exoplanets. And each of them, and, and, pretty, and while we didn't know where the planets exist around other stars, now we know that pretty much every star will have at least a planet associated with it, or we suspect that. But, so we've got this amazing kind of breakthroughs in astronomy, but we also have breakthroughs in chemistry. So we have these uh, wonderful um, prebiotic chemists, so they're trying to make life in a lab, working out how you put together different molecules and go from kind of abiotic, this is just a bunch of chemicals, to actually something living. And the other aspect of it is we have uh, amazing work being done on things like the Mars missions, where we're going back and we're actually looking at the geology of Mars. So because of plate tectonics here on Earth, the are uh, kind of as you go further back in time, you have less rock available because it gets subducted down and you lose it. Whereas as with as uh, the Mars Perseverance mission continues with sample returns, you've got the possibility of actually looking for kind of signals of life in the Mars rocks. And of course, with biology, trying to understand what evolution is like and what evolution will be like on other planets. And so, what the centre is doing is it's bringing together all these disciplines because we're now at a point where we're finding fascinating things within our disciplines but we need to essentially talk more within uh, between disciplines to really understand and try and work out what's going on on a broader scale. And it is truly mind-boggling to me that we are at the point where we can start to maybe think about and interrogate whether or not these exoplanets zillions of miles away are actually harbouring any life forms or, or starting, I suppose, are you able to start to profile some of them to start asking that question? And do you think we'll ever be in a position where we'll actually be able to get some sort of answers to some of these questions? I, I, really, I really do hope so. So um, one of the key mechanisms we have for looking at life on other planets is looking at the atmosphere compositions of different planets. And 
we've got the capability of looking for these different sorts of atmospheric com compositions. And so when you get, for example, very high levels of water or oxygen, that's very highly indicative of life. And so we can potentially look at these spectrum, the transmission spectrums of the different planets, and, and identify these potential life signatures, biosignatures on other planets. And hopefully, with any luck, that will then lead to multiple different discoveries of, of life elsewhere. So, in your opinion, we, we are not alone. Well, <laughs> I hope we're not alone. I, I, uh, I, well, we, we will see, I mean, if we're lucky, maybe in 10 years, maybe in 20 years. But I think when we're thinking about aliens and life elsewhere, we tend to think in terms of us, and which are animals. And to me, this is a really kind of interesting question because life started so soon after the planet formed. But because it was microbial for, for so long, it kind of does suggest that maybe life on other planets will be microbial. So it will exist, it will be there, but it won't be complex like us. And so then in terms of are we alone, do you feel alone if it's just you and a bunch of bacteria? You kind of do, right? <laughs> so I'm, I'm not so sure about that, about whether there is complex life elsewhere. I think it's statistically, well, I mean, that is the big question to me. And it depends on how and why animals originated here on Earth and whether that's a mechanism that's likely to be replicated on other planets or whether yeah, we just got very lucky to be here at all. Which circles all the way back to your research mm. as, to, as to where these very early life forms, how they then evolved into much more complex beings. In, indeed, yes. Yeah. I mean, that's why, why I study what I do. It's like this is the great, for me, the great question in evolution is what, you know, why and how did animals uh, yeah, originate when they did. I mean, this has just been fantastic to, to, to find out that all of this is being researched, but also the timescales that you were talking about, 10, 20 years, you know, things are moving so fast mm. in so many disciplines now, aren't mm. they? Our, our project is around the library of the great silence and the question as to whether or not we are heading for an existential disaster. Maybe we're going to evolve and our intelligence is going to get to such a point that we end up blowing ourselves to bits or whatever other catastrophe or ecological. Is there any, any perspective that you can give from your, your work on, on those types of questions? So, well, so... I mean, the big question, why aren't we hearing from life uh, elsewhere, is a very interesting one. I mean, the distances involved are huge. I mean, you, I can't get my head around them. But from an Earth perspective, we've actually been shouting that we're alive here on this planet for, for two billion years, ever since our oxygen levels rose very, very rapidly about two billion years ago. So we've been visible. <laughs> and there's no evidence that any, a, anything has kind of attempted to contact us. And I think that's the, that's the other thing is kind of when we're thinking about us all going extinct, we're thinking about humans potentially. All animals, that's quite unlikely. Um, even if you lose all animals, you still have plants, you still have fungi, you've got a lot of life that's going on. And the chances that we get to a point as humanity where we literally wipe, wipe out all of life, I think is pretty, pretty unlikely. So yes, we, we do not want to be living in a humanless world. We don't definitely need to do a lot better about protecting the world we live in. But I think there's, yes, again, we need to think about it kind of from a humans, animals kind of life, different, different scales, I guess. That's, no, I think that's a really nice way to, to, to finish that often I think we we probably one of the pickles we get ourselves into is, is we're always thinking about just from a human mm. point of view and we're not really we cease to be as connected as we need to be back to some of these really mm. fundamental life forces these great big movements that, that are, are what help to sustain us on this wonderful planet indeed yes <laughs> Well, maybe that's a good point at which to say thank you so much for this conversation. It's been absolutely fascinating to find out about your work. And also, thank you for our fossil, which you are going to induct into the library for the, for the Cambridge Festival. Well, thank you. It's wonderful talking to you about all the things that uh, we do here in Cambridge and indeed for uh, everyone getting excited about our Charnia fossil. Thank you. Thank you so much.